Hi, uh, this is 637. I'm Charles Bowman, and we're doing uh, actually a lecture uh, uh, to make up a, a lecture. Uh, so, and the, the material we're going to cover today is on digital imaging systems and digital cameras and digital lenses, uh, or not, well, analog lenses actually. But uh, so let's get right to it. Um, so, uh, um, of course, uh, the primary topic of this course is digital imaging. And, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, the way uh, images are often captured are with uh, optical imaging systems and particularly cameras. So, uh, sort of the, the mainstay of, of uh, professional, professional photographers is what they call the, uh, the single lens reflex camera. These, these days it's called the digital single lens reflex camera, or DLSR. DSLR, I'm sorry, DSLR. So, uh, and uh, the way a, a DSLR works, I mean, there, uh, there's a number of manuf there's uh, quite a few manufacturers which make them. Two of the more prominent ones are uh, Nikon and uh, Canon, but there are many more. And here the, I'm showing a Nikon uh, uh, SLR because uh, actually uh, this is similar to one that I own. Um, so, the way it works is that uh, with, with an SLR, uh, the, the thing that distinguishes it is that when you look through the viewfinder, you're actually looking through the actual lens to see what the, the image uh, you're going to take a picture of uh, looks like. I guess in some ways it's not as distinct as it used to be because with digital cameras, uh, imaging sensors are often used to actually relay the image to an LCD. So you're looking at the image from that perspective that you'd be taking a picture of. But in the days of analog film, of course, um, uh, you couldn't have uh, an LCD display because there wasn't a digital imaging sensor to catch, capture the image in real time. But with the DLSR, what happens is there's a mirror here that reflects the light up through a prism, and then the viewfinder, uh, uh, you, you view that light. So, so uh, the light passes into the camera, bounces off this mirror, passes up through some lenses, bounces through this prism, and then goes to the viewfinder to where your eye is. So you're, you're looking uh, here. Um, so that's your eye. So um, then when you go to take the picture, it's actually a, a very interesting piece of mechanical engineering because uh, what has to happen is, first of all, the shutter closes in the aperture in the lens. Then the, um, uh, this prism flips up. Okay, uh, uh, to get out of the way to let the light in uh, to where the sensor is. Then, um, then the aperture opens up for the prescribed amount of time, exposes the light on the sensor, the, the, the sensor digitizes the incoming light, it's stored in uh, local memory in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, the camera, and then the, the um, uh, mirror flips back down. And the, all this movement has a distinctive sound that it produces that I'm sure people are familiar with. In fact, they they add that sound digitally to inexpensive cameras to make people feel good. So when they push the button, they hear something. You know, it goes ch ch sort of. A, well, that's not really what it sounds like. But in any case, um, these are pretty high-end cameras generally because the lens, lenses can be exchangeable. So you can... Um, uh, put on a lens that's optimized for your particular imaging scenario. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, a typical uh, camera these days, uh, I just looked at some uh, cameras, I mean, 12 megapixel camera that goes from 100 to 6400 ISO. It's, the actual camera body is about $1,500. And then, of course, you have to buy a lens flash and, uh, and digital media to go with that. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, in fact, it used to be that the main marketing point for these cameras was the number of pixels, uh, so the number of megapixels, but in fact, some of the more expensive cameras have fewer megapixels because they trade off megapixels for other things that are, might be desirable, like speed on the camera. Uh, so, uh, um... You know, the, the key item in the design of the camera is the, is the lens. And I want to take a little time to talk about properties of lenses so you have some concept of how that works. Um, so the lens 
a lens is designed with a specific focal distance. So the idea is that if the light comes in a, in a parallel beam, then the uh, uh, then the light beam will be focused at the position of uh, of, a, of the focal distance. So if you have the focal plane uh, is is parallel to the lens and at precisely the focal distance, then parallel beams of light will be focused precisely on that um, focal plane array. Um, uh, so how do you get parallel beams of light? Well, for instance, if you go out at night and if you ignore atmospheric dis uh, distortions, you can approximate the light that comes from a star that's light years away as being parallel. Because it comes such a large distance, right? So if this is this is, uh, this is a star that's light years away. If you're far f enough away, uh, so close to the source, it looks like a circle. And as you get further from the source, the plane, the plane wave becomes more and more parallel. And by the time it gets here, it almost like a, looks perfectly parallel. So a source of light that's very, very far away, and a point source of light that's very far away, uh, will produce a parallel beam of light. And that's and that parallel beam of light then will get focused down to a point in, in the image that would be the point corresponding to your image of the star. Because and with a camera you couldn't resolve any surface detail on, on the star. I mean if you had a very high power telescope and it's a nearby star, I mean perhaps you'd be able to see something but for or, or near a planet uh, in the solar system, but for objects that are very very far away, the angle subtended by the object is so small that all, that it's effectively a point of light. Okay. Now, um, uh, so now what happens is that, of course, you're often imaging things that aren't infinitely far away or extremely far away. So in, in that case, the object distance uh, is uh, some finite quantity, and we'll define that as d sub o for the object distance. And then the focal distance of the image of the lens, that's a property of the lens, d sub f. So this is a property of the lens. The focal distance is the distance that you need to have the focal, the focal plane away from the lens. It's the distance to the focal plane when you have ideal uh, focusing of an infinite source of light onto the plane. So this is a property of the lens. Now in practice, uh, the object distance may be less than infinity away, in which case you have to adjust the focal plane of the, uh, uh, in order to, to get that object in, into focus. And the equation that describes that is right here. So if uh, uh, d sub i is the distance to the image plane, and d sub o is the distance to the object, d sub f is the property of the lens, the focal distance, then 1 over d sub o plus 1 over d sub i is, needs to be equal to 1 over d sub f. So let's say if, if um, there's some scenarios that you can consider, give you a little intuition. If d, o, d sub o is equal to infinity, then this equation is 1 over infinity plus 1 over d sub i is equal to 1 over d sub f. So that just reduces to 1 over d sub i equals 1 over d sub f. So that means that d sub i is equal to d sub f. So that's just what we had before, which is that if the object is infinitely far away, then it focuses at the focal distance. Okay? Then another possibility is that, uh, uh, but if uh, d sub, if d sub, uh, uh, well, d sub o is less than infinity, okay, then what would happen is 1 over d sub i is equal to 1 over d sub f minus 1 over d sub o. So uh, in that case, if, if this is less than infinity, then this number is a, is a positive constant, which you subtract. So then d sub i, so that implies that uh, d sub i is going to be, uh, let's see. So if this is positive, so that, that, that'll make this smaller and the reciprocal of a smaller number is larger, so that'll mean that d sub i is, g is greater than d sub f in that case. Right. So as the object moves in, the image plane moves out. 
and and their relationship is is controlled by that equation. Now, um, what also happens now is that there's an effect of magnification. If uh, an object has some particular size, then as you can think of it as sort of uh, reflected through the lens. You know, one limiting case we'll talk about in a minute is a pinhole camera. So you can think of this as being a pinhole and the light rays pass through. And um, if the image plane is close and the object is far, then the image will be smaller than the object. That's the normal case that occurs with a camera, right? When you image a scene, the image on the sensor array is very small. So it might be a tree, but it's it's on the surface of the sensor array, it's very small. But in the real world, it's large, okay? So in this case, the magnification is uh, is less than one. And the negative, it, the, well, in general, the magnification is is a negative number because the image will be flipped upside down. But mostly, uh, we're also, but we're also concerned about the magnitude of this number. So if, if uh, uh, D sub O is much greater than d sub i, right? So the um, object is a lot further away than the imaging plane. So that would be, this would be like a camera. Camera, okay. Okay, and uh, in that, that would be like a point and shoot camera. So what would happen in that case is m here equals minus d sub i over uh, d sub o. So this is, uh, so the absolute value of m in this case is much less than 1. So the magnification is less than 1 in terms of its, the magnitude of the magnification is mu much less than 1. And the negative sign indicates that the thing is flipped upside down. If, on the other hand, though, d sub i is much less than d sub o, see, that can actually happen. Uh, and in, in that case, m here is going to be equal to minus d sub i over d sub o is, uh, so that's, in that case, the, the absolute value of m is much greater than 1. So in there you actually get positive magnification. So when do you think it is that you would get a lens, so here's the lens, okay, and here is the object. And then the image, the focal plane here. In this case, the focal plane is far away and the lens is close to the object. When does that occur? So I'm drawing a pretty bad version of this. But this would now be your eyeball. This is a microscope. In a microscope, you have to magnify uh, the object a lot. So this lens has to get very close to the, uh, to the object you're trying to magnify. So this is a microscope. Okay. Um, so both cases are, are useful. Also, you can buy cameras. If you buy an expensive camera, often it'll have the lens on it will have a... Uh, what they call macro uh, setting. So in the macro setting, you can actually take pictures of very small things and have them magnified onto the surface of the lens, uh, a surface of the imaging array. So you can use your your camera to take pictures of like insects or small animals or plants. Okay. And, and this, this just explains what I've just described uh, in, uh, in, in the notes. So for a typical microscope, you have magnification. And for a typical uh, uh, photography application, you have reduction. And here I should probably put absolute values in front of the M's since it's really the magnitude of M that we're talking about here. Um, the, the sign is always negative just because... Um, you get reflection, uh, inversion of the image onto the surface of the imaging array. So now, um, 
what happens is that this is a very important topic, aperture and f-stop. So uh, the lens, um, um, in, in practice, a lens can only be made so large. And uh, for lots of reasons, and we'll discuss them. And some of them are cost, some of them are limitations in your ability to fabricate, some of them are practical limitations, like you wouldn't want a large lens in your um, cell phone because it would take up too much space. But uh, so in addition, usually there's some aperture that controls access of the light to the lens. And the aperture has a distinctive uh, look to it in typical imaging like cameras. And what happens is that uh, it looks like this. You, you, there's like a, a, a set of metal uh, thin plates that are designed to sort of overlay like this, okay? It should be symmetric, so it for, should form a circle. And then as these leaves sort of slide in, they control the aperture. So it's almost a circular aperture. And inside here, the light can go through, and outside here, it hits the black metal plate. So by controlling this, you can open or close the aperture to the lens. And it's just like the iris of your eye. You know, if you go outside, all of a sudden you're blinded because there's too much light coming in on a sunny day. And then your, the aperture of your eye closes down. The iris, the muscle there, constrains, and it closes the light down, and it lets less light in, okay? So you'd say, well, why not always let the most light in? Well, there's various reasons. Sometimes you get out of the dynamic range of the sensor, like you would if you go outside on a sunny day. But there's other reasons to lower the aperture, and I'll talk about them in just a minute. So uh, there's a concept of f-stop of a lens and uh, aperture. So the aperture is the diameter of the, uh, of the circular opening in the lens. Usually it's approximately circular. So here you have this aperture here. This would be A, right? So the area is really going to be equal to uh, pi r squared which is uh, pi, oh, hold on for a second. So it's pi r squared, right? So r is equal to pi over d over 2 squared, right? So that's going to be equal to pi d squared over 4. So here it would be uh, pi over 4 a squared. So the amount of light that is let in is proportional to this, the area. And um, so the f-stop uh, n is equal to uh, the, the focal length of the, of, the, of the lens divided by the aperture. So that's the standard definition. I'll put a triangle here because it's the definition of the f-stop n. And what happens is that if n is large, you're letting in, uh, okay, if n is large, it means that the aperture has gone down. That means less light. And uh, less light means that, well, what it really means is that when you go to take the picture, you're going to have, if you can let less light in, that you have to leave the aperture open longer. So the shutter speed has to be longer to compensate. So often this is described as being slower. Less light is slower because the less light you have, the longer you have to leave the aperture open. And if you have to leave the aperture open too long, then you get blurring in the image. So if you're taking pictures of sports photography or, um, say, race cars, you need a very fast aperture, a very fast uh, shutter speed, okay? So this is slower shutter speed. So um, uh, you need a... You need a, 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 a faster shutter speed in that case. So in that case, what you'd want is you'd want a smaller f-stop. So let me do the converse here. So if you have n is small, 
then that implies that uh, A is large, okay? And if the aperture is large, that's more light. A low, more light means faster uh, shutter speed. And they say that's a fast lens, okay? So a lens, so here would be some examples. If you had n equals, if you had to say, for instance, n equals 2.8, that's your f-stop. That's fast, okay? Lots of light. Oops, light. Okay, if you have n equals 5, that's slow. Not much light. Not lots of light. Now, the other thing that's interesting is if you look at this formula, the, um, the area is proportional to a squared, and n is, is inversely proportional to a. So light is proportional to uh, area uh, is equal to um, pi over 4a squared. So that's equal to uh, pi over 4. And this is going to be uh, 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 df over n squared. So that's going to be equal to pi over 4 df squared times 1 over n squared. So the light is um, inversely proportional to the, squ to the square of the, of the, uh, of the f-stop. So if you go from, um, if you have f, um, say, I don't know, uh, you say f equals, uh, oh, I don't know, 3, okay? And you go from that to um, n equals 6. This is 4x the light. That's why if you buy lenses, what will often happen is that if you go uh, uh, up by, the, they'll go up in roughly uh, increments of the square root of 2. So every time you go up by the square root of 2 in, in the f-stop, or you go down by the square root of 2 in f-stop, you're going to double the amount of light. So, uh, so an n equals 2.8 lens is much more expensive. Then, for instance, an, uh, n equals 5. So that would be about two f-stops, so about four times the amount of light. So people will pay a lot more money for that lens. Uh, okay, so now, so you say, well, now, is it always better to just have a larger f-stop or uh, a faster lens with a lower f-stop? Do you let more light in? Well, the answer is it's not always better. Uh, there's some important trade-offs. Now, anybody who's a photographer, if you talk to a photographer and you say, well, um, is it better to have a larger f-stop or a smaller f-stop, or a larger aperture or a smaller aperture, they'll say, well, it, it really depends on what you're trying to do, okay? If, if you have a telescope, you, uh, telescopes, the better the telescope is, the larger the aperture. That's why if you go to like a very, very, you know, huge telescope, it costs many, many millions of dollars. They'll have a huge lens, okay? Or they'll use a lot of small lenses that they coherently integrate together, so it's effectively like a large lens. Why is that? Well, it turns out that this is the lens, okay? And this is the image. Okay, this, this is the Fourier domain. 
I mean, I, I can't derive the equations for this, but they're actually not that complicated. So this, you can think of this as f of uv. And this is the space domain. This is image domain. And this will be uh, f of xy. Now, the f of uv has to be interpreted and the f of x, y have to be interpreted as complex quantities because it has to be the electromagnetic uh, uh, the uh, uh, signal, which it would be like the electric field, which is a sign quantity. It can go positive or negative. An image normally only goes positive because you're taking the energy of the photons to actually form the image. But if you interpret this electromagnetic field as a sign quantity, as an electric field, then this is the Fourier transform of this. So we all know that the larger in the frequency domain, uh, the larger the aperture in frequency, so this is uh, f of omega, and this is, or f of f, oops, and this is f, okay? The larger that is, the, s the smaller the impulse function, right? So larger this way means smaller this way. So if we get, uh, if we get a large aperture here, we'll get a small impulse response here. A small impulse response means we'll get a sharper image. So by retaining more frequencies, uh, we get a sharper image. So by this logic, the theory of, uh, of, of uh, electromagnetic propagation tells us that the larger the lens is, the sharper the image is. However, in practice, that's not always practically true. It's true in a huge telescope when it's been designed to be perfect or very close to perfect, but in a real uh, camera, in a real imaging scenario, it's not always true. And, and there's two reasons why it's not true. There's two reasons why in, uh, in constraining the aperture can actually increase the resolution in the image. One is because there might be a two, there, uh, so there's two, two problems, two problems. Uh, with large aperture. One is that you get distortion in lens. So as you get further out to the edges of the lens, there's more and more distortion in the lens. And two is that, um, uh, that well, there's this other effect called depth of field. So the problem is this, as the lens gets larger and larger, it'll give you, if it's a perfect lens, it'll give you a sharper and sharper image, but only for images which are exactly in focus. If the image isn't exactly in focus, then you'll lose actually um, resolution more rapidly. And to see that, we can look at this diagram right here. Okay, so here, lens depth of field. So this diagram sort of illustrates conceptually, it's not a proof, but it just gives you a rough argument for how depth of field works. And this, uh, if the image is exactly, this is the focal distance of the image. So, so this is the, the image is, uh, imaging plane is some distance from the lens. And for this focal length of lens, then uh, something that at this distance would be precisely in focus. So here you get the theoretical point spread function associated with the aperture, okay? So which is the point spread function here, size is inversely proportional to the size of the aperture. A larger aperture here will give you a, sh a smaller point spread function, a sharper image. But if you deviate from that, then uh, you'll lose resolution. So, and the size of the resolution you'll lose is corresponds to the aperture blur you get in this this diagram. So, so you have the following expression here, that the uh, D here is the, uh, uh, okay, so the point spread function C0 is the blur, okay? That's this quantity, it's the, it's the blur point sp uh, spread size in the image domain. D is the uh, depth of field, okay? And N is the f-stop of the lens, and M is the magnification. So, um, the relationship is this, that, that D over C0 uh, is equal to 2N over minus M, okay? So, 
Uh, so uh, what it means is that the depth of field is equal to 2n um, times c0 over minus m. So if, um, so if you fix the resolution c0 and you ask what's the depth of field you get with that resolution, then the resolution, then the depth of field increases as uh, n gets larger. So as n gets larger, remember, n, as n gets larger, the aperture gets smaller. So it's, so, uh, so a, a smaller aperture implies that d gets larger. So a smaller aperture will result in a greater depth of field. That's why photographers will tell you that let's say you have a, a lens that's n uh, 2.8. You might actually want to use, even though it's an n 2.8 lens, you might want to make n equal to n 8, an aperture f 8. Or, or actually, the way that they write that, I don't know why, but they write f 2.8. It means that the aperture is 2.8. So you might want to go to f 8, okay? And f8 could give you a sharper image than f2.8 because the depth of field, because if the object's out of focus, it still stays pretty sharp over a wider range of depth of field. People also use this for artistic purposes. Uh, if you're taking a picture of a person um, in, a, uh, uh, in a background, and you want, so you have like a scene here, right? and you have some various, there's a person here, okay? You want the person to be in focus, but you don't want the background to be in focus. You want the background to be blurred out. Then you want a wide aperture. You want, um, you want uh, say, you know, f 2.8 in that case, because then everything that's not, that you don't want to see is out of focus. If you watch cinematography, like movies, you'll see this all the time, where they'll, they'll use depth of field to control what you see, what is, uh, what the, what, if, where the attention is focused in the scene. They'll use, okay? Now, if on the other hand, uh, you have the person here and you're taking, you're, you're uh, you know, at Mount Everest or something like that, and you're taking a, a picture and you want these, the trees in the background to be in focus, along with the person, in that case, you want to use like, you know, F8, because then the uh, smaller aperture will give you greater depth of field and both the person and the background will be in focus, okay? So, okay, now, um, uh, one of the, um, okay, so uh, we're going to use a lot of linear space invariant system theory to describe imaging systems. Uh, so the reason we can do that is that they're well approximated by that. As I described, uh, when you have the lens, and then there's an aperture here, and there's a focal plane, this is, this is the Fourier domain, and this is the image domain. So, uh, so what will happen is that in the image domain, um, the, uh, the, the, the image here you should have, you should have, uh, would have liked to have uh, formed, uh, is say f of x, y, will be convolved with some point spread function, which we'll call h of uh, x, y, to produce the actual image, which is g of x, y. And the point spread function here will be h of x, y will be equal to the inverse Fourier transform. So it's the inverse discrete, oh, I'm sorry, continuous space Fourier transform of uh, h of u, v, where h of u, v is this aperture. Now, um, um, I'm, I'm, the things I'm saying here are not completely and precisely true because I'm mixing a few metaphors 
what, what's happened is that this interpretation is precisely true if this is the electromagnetic field, but the images you usually form here are from the energy in the, uh, in the signal. But really, uh, using uh, the approximations of non-coherent integration of photons, it all kind of works out pretty much the same way. And what happens is the image you form on the focal plane array is the convolution of the, of the, uh, uh, of the image you should have formed with the point spread function of the system. And um, so basically, uh, if you take away the magnification factor, the resulting uh, image is like conv convolution of the, uh, of the, what the true image should have been with the point spread function of the imaging system. Now, um, so then uh, the point spread function is h of x, y, and, uh, and it's a continuous space Fourier transform is going to be h of u, v. And uh, h of u, v then characterizes the imaging system. Now, real imaging systems are not perfectly space invariant because as you uh, move around on the image plane, the point spread function for the system will be a little different. So, you know, one way you can actually measure this, and if you have a camera, you can actually go out and do this. Go out on a, on a starry evening, right, and take your camera, put it on a tripod, if you have a tripod. I've done this before, it's great fun. And look at some of the stars in the sky, because the stars in the side are almost perfect points. And then what will happen is you'll get, you'll get an image, and it'll have little points in it. And you can take that, put it onto your computer, and zoom in, and you'll see that when you zoom into that point, it's not really a point. It's sort of like a blur. It's a few pixels wide. And you can actually try it with different apertures. And you'll see that if you use a really, if you use like F, if you use F, I don't know, 16, if you use a really small aperture, the blur will get bigger. Okay? And if you use F, uh, uh, I don't know, 3, the blur will be smaller. At least if the camera is perfectly in focus. You have to set it to an infinity um, uh, focal distance. But uh, so this this point spread function, so it's you put essentially you you put a, a delta function, delta x y, because because the star is like a delta function. You put the delta function into this imaging system, and what you got out was you got the point spread function. So this is the point spread function. If you take the Fourier transform of that, that tells you what the frequency response of your 2D imaging system is. Now, often people don't worry too much about the phase, so they mostly focus in on the, um, on the magnitude of this thing. So you have, uh, so you have h of x, y. That's the point spread function. It might look like, in a typical scenario, it might look like this. I'm really pretty bad at drawing these things. I'm trying to draw this thing in two dimensions, three dimensions. But anyway, and then it's, uh, it's continuous space Fourier transform will be h of u, v. Now, if h of x, y equals h of minus x minus y, then h of u, v will be real. If not, it's going to be complex. So often people are interested more in, well, let's look at what the magnitude of h of u, v looks like. And we'll normalize by h of 0, 0. So what's h of 0, 0? Everybody should know this. h of 0, 0 is equal to the integral of h of x, y dx dy. It's the area under the point spread function. So, um, so this is going to be normalized. And if you plot that, oh, this thing here is called the modulation transfer function. or MTF. So 
So if you plot the MTF, like in one day, for instance. So this would be like along the U axis. It'll be something like this, say. And you can look at the cutoff frequency. So the uh, units here are typically things like uh, um, uh, this is uh, cycles per inch. And that tells you the number of cycles, uh, that tells you the, the frequency, uh, the highest frequency that your system control can, can pass. So you might have like the halfway point, you might have 3 dB down. 3 dB is the square root of 2 in, uh, uh, in these units. So, so this is how you often characterize the spatial resolution of an imaging system. Of course, if you have uh, a wider MTF, then you have higher resolution. If you have a narrower MTF, you have narrower, you have less resolution, and the point spread function is larger. So larger in the frequency domain corresponds to smaller in the space domain. Um, good. Okay, well, I think that's all the material we have to cover for this lecture. So um, uh, we'll be uh, uh, seeing you uh, at the next lecture, and uh, thanks a lot. Bye.